Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Eider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, Brenton USA Hunting Rifles, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Well, thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to another edition of the Outdoor Magazine radio show right here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network. More than 30 stations across the great state of Michigan. This is a three-hour show, a three-hour weekly show designed to promote, encourage, protect, and inform about the great outdoors here in the great state of Michigan. We concentrate, uh, concentrate primarily on hunting and fishing and shooting and trapping and wildlife issues and conservation issues and even some wild game cooking. It's a pretty cool job to have, and I admit it. I am blessed by God. I, I, I thank him every day to have this opportunity and to be able to do this for so many years. And isn't it a wonderful time of year right now? Welcome to September. As I know the folks watching the live stream are going to go, Avery, it's not September. No, by the time you hear this radio show, it will be September. It's Labor Day weekend. Where did the summertime go? Don't we ask ourselves this every year? Where did the summertime go? Did you get a chance to do the things that you wanted to do? Did you get a chance to see the sights here in Michigan, to take your family, to take the kids, take the grandkids on that camping trip, to take that fishing charter trip, to spend as much time chasing salmon or chasing bass or chasing pike or chasing walleye or chasing panfish. Oh, there's so much to do in our great state, and we're on this. September is one of these, I call them shoulder months. It's not really summer, it's not really fall, but it's a great time of year. Hunting seasons have already started. The hunting season in Michigan has started. Now, that doesn't mean that fishing is over, right? We all know that. Some of the best fishing of the year is in the fall. But the hunting season has officially started. Elk season's open. Early, te- and I, I, can't, I can't call it the early experimental teal season anymore because it's now official se- an official season. Teal season is open for waterfall hunters. And, of course, my favorite season, the giant flying rat season. You're going, Avery, what is that? That's the early goose season. Remember? Remember this? There are rats, the four-legged rodents. There are flying rats, seagulls. And then there are giant flying rats, also known as Canada geese. And I say, please go out there and shoot as many of those things as you can. Because I hear they taste really good. But they're a messy nuisance critter that I am so glad we have this early season to help thin some of those resident birds out. What else? Bear season is just around the corner. The youth hunt is coming up next weekend. I will be taking my grandson Carter out for the youth hunt using that Brenton USA 350 legend. Now I'm going to get him out this weekend because I, 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 I have that gun sighted in and I feel like it's broken in, but Carter hasn't shot it yet. And I don't want to put him out uh, at my buddy Scott's place over a food plot and have a big doe walk in front of him and have Carter unfamiliar with the gun. He hasn't shot it yet. So I'm going to take it out this weekend, uh, take him out this weekend, hopefully, or at least sometime in the next week, and uh, have him put a few rounds through that so he's comfortable with it. So when that big, beautiful doe walks in front of us on the youth hunt that... uh, Carter has a good chance. The youth hunt, that's an interesting thing. I, I, I will save the bulk of my comments for next week, but I'm a huge fan of the youth hunt. I think it's a great idea. I, I know not everybody loves it. I know it has its uh, critics, 
People say that uh, adults will use the, use the youth hunt as an excuse to shoot an animal themselves. Anybody who does that is a dirtbag. If, if you would shoot a big buck during the youth season with your kid in the blind, that's just plain wrong. It's obviously not legal. It's not ethical. And it's just immoral. That's the wrong thing to do. Now, I don't think many people do that. But I have people tell me all the time, Avery, you're being naive. It happens all the time. And I hope and pray that that's not the case. I do not believe that there's a, a significant percentage of Michigan hunters who are so rotten that they would do that. I know it happens, but I, I don't think it happens often. People say, well, why do the kids get a chance to get out there and shoot these big bucks? They haven't earned it yet. Well, why should they have to earn it? Why should a kid have to earn the chance to go hunting? Did you earn the chance to go hunting? Oh, yeah. I had to wait until November 15th, and it was cold, and I was miserable. Well, is, is that how you want the kids of today introduced to the sport of deer hunting? When it's cold and when it's miserable? <laughs> Don't we want to give these kids? Because, listen... It, Kids today are different than they used to be. I don't think you can argue that. And not, I mean, not in some families, but overall, culturally, kids today are different than they used to be. And they've got a lot of different things vying for their attention. They have a lot of different things. Uh, their attention span isn't as long as it used to be. So why would we want to make them sit in a blind for hours in the cold in the middle of November waiting for a shot at an animal when we can show them what hunting is like in September, when it's warm, it's comfortable, the deer don't know they're being hunted yet? Yes, it gives them an advantage. Of course it does. But isn't that the purpose? Don't we want that? Oh, well, they shot my buck I've been watching all eh, It's not your buck. So what? So you've got pictures of this animal. So you've got trail camera pictures of this animal. So, he, you, so you put in a food plot to attract him to your uh, property. So he's on your hit list. So you gave him a name, just like all the big TV shows do, right? You did everything the big TV shows do. It doesn't mean it's your buck. It's not your buck until you put a tag on it. And so what? So if a kid shoots it ahead of time? It's just a deer. It's not the holy grail. It doesn't change your life, but it could change that kid's life. It could turn him into a hunter. Well, just because they go out and take an easy buck during the youth hunt doesn't mean they're going to be a hunter. That one I agree with. That one I agree with. They may not be a lifelong hunter. That, I think, is a valid statement. But if you give that kid the opportunity to go hunting when they are a kid, they have the experience, and years down the road, and maybe just a few years down the road, when they get asked to vote on a hunting-related issue... They will have some experience, and they will have, have a frame of reference. So I, I think it's all good. I really do. I think it's all good. Uh, would I like to see the youth hunt be does only? You bet. I think that would be a great idea. That would take a lot of the social pressure off the youth hunt. Does only. If we've got too many does in our state, make it does only. The problem is that won't work in all parts of our state, right? So what else? What else? Uh, I said bear season's coming up. Seeing a lot of pictures of beautiful bears on trail camera in the middle of the day. How long is that going to last? <laughs> Isn't that the problem with everything? And haven't trail cameras changed the way that we hunt? It's changed the way that we pattern deer. Changed the way we keep an eye on the bears. Uh, and the cellular trail cameras. My buddy Johnny Bowler now is putting cell cameras in the middle of the swamp in the UP where there's just a marginal signal, but enough to get pictures out of there. I got high hopes for you, Johnny. I keep teasing Johnny Bowler, the bear whisperer, about the fact that I want to shoot a big bear. Honestly, I, I, I want a respectable bear, yes. But I've never taken a bear in Michigan before. So I don't, Johnny, listen, don't hold out for a 300-pound bear for me, buddy. Put me on a nice, respectable bear that I can have a good quality hunt with, enjoy the experience, and get some good bear brats for the grill. And I'm a happy guy. I'm a happy guy. 
Oh, what else? Oh, my new boat's done. <laughs> my new Angler Quest is done. <laughs> realistically, I don't see myself using that boat much this fall, maybe for a perch trip or two, but really I've, I've, I've turned the corner, um, and, and I'm in a hunting mode now. I realized, like I said a few minutes ago, there's some excellent fall fishing and I may be crazy for not taking advantage of it. And maybe I will, maybe, maybe I will take advantage of it more than I thought, but, um, I just appreciate the fact that that boat is there now, whether I use it this fall or wait until next spring. I can't, uh, I can't wait to get my hands on that. What else? Wednesday Night Live. Every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we do a Wednesday Night Live on my social media outlets. That's a great chance for you and I to interact. The radio show is wonderful, right? But for the past 11 minutes, you've sat here and listened to me talk, and you can't talk back to me. And I know sometimes that's frustrating. And I know sometimes you want to say, but Avery, well, if you join me on the Wednesday Night Lives at 7 o'clock on my social media outlets, you can interact with me. You can ask me questions. You can say, Avery, you're an idiot. And, and, and we can have a conversation. Coming up after the break here on the Outdoor Magazine radio show, the captain of the Michigan Charter Boat Association, Bill Winowicki. A lot of things going on, including some great fall fishing right now. But a lot of things behind the scenes, the consent decree negotiations, Charter Boat Association is not real happy with the DNR right now. A lot of people not happy with the DNR. Then Tom Campbell of Woods and Water News, their big outdoor weekend coming up. All that and lots more coming up this week right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Flint on Sports Extra 1330 WTRX. You can hear us in Ludington on News 97, 98, 98.7 WLDN. And north of the bridge in Marquette, WDMJ 1320 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by the Linwood Beach Marina and Campground. Linwood Beach can be your year-round Saginaw Bay Fishing destination and your Mid Michigan Tracker and Angler Quest headquarters. You know, I love that. For more info, check them out online at linwoodbeachmarina.com, linwoodbeachmarina.com. Uh, during the break, talking to a buddy, he said the walleye bite on Saginaw Bay is still on if you know where to look. The perch bite is doing pretty good. And of course, that tremendous fall fishery is coming up as well. Linwood Beach Marina, a good place to be your jumping off spot for Saginaw Bay, linwoodbeachmarina.com. Uh, also, too, a, a quick reminder, I was talking about the uh, hunting season kicking off here in Michigan. And one thing I forgot to mention, the small game season coming up here very soon. Small game, I just overlooked it, and I'm remiss for doing that. Small game, a great way to get a kid involved in the outdoors. And it is overlooked these days with all the attention on bears and turkey and waterfall. Let's not forget small game hunting. Oh, I have not... Spent any time on Lake Michigan in the past few years. That was kind of something that my dad and I did. And, and you know, since he's been gone, it just doesn't feel right. But, man, am I missing some tremendous fishing. The, the salmon fishing, especially on Lake Michigan this year, has been, well, from what I hear, world class. Bill Winnewicki would have a much better idea about this, though, because he is a charter captain, he, and he is the uh, president of the Michigan Charter Boat Association, a group of which I am a member. And it's, it's been so hard to get in touch with Bill, but he's got an open morning, and he has graciously agreed to spend some time with us. Cap, welcome back to the show. How are you? Thank you, Mike. Uh, yeah, you caught me on a wind day. <laughs> so listen, the, 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 how is the fishing this late summer, early fall? How would you describe it? The salmon fishing... In the last three years has improved immensely. Um, I fish up north here, Leland, Glen Arbor, Sleeping Bear Dunes area. Um, seeing a lot of small fish, some mediums, and some really big fish. Um, our lake trout fishery this year seems to have been down, but I do believe that up here we had some issue with some commercial netting, but uh, I do believe it has more to do with the uh, alewife die-off. 
um, where you have little fish flickering in two foot of cold water to 200 foot of cold water, and there's millions of them that sort of scattered the lake trout about the lake. But the salmon fishery is really starting to come back nicely. Alewife die off now. That, I heard that about that earlier in the summer, but that's that's something we haven't seen in years. Bill, is that is that significant? Does that mean there are more bait fish out there than than what had been previously thought, at least? I would highly think so, Mike. I mean, we're we're marking a lot of bait up here up north, and I talked to the captains down south, and they're seeing a lot of bait too. Um, I mean, whenever you get a cold winter and uh, you, in a cold spring, you get a die off at, at times because of lack of feed. They tend to starve to death. And I imagine with the zebra mussels, the lack of feed in the lake and the amount of alewives now is starting to show that. You know, you talk about where you fish out of up in the northern part of the lake. Man, you, you couldn't pick a more beautiful spot to be based out of, Bill. Uh, I still say I got the most beautiful charter tip in the state of Michigan, and uh, the people love it. I mean... If I go towards Empire, I got the Sleeping Bear Dunes. If I go towards Leland, I got the Pyramid Point. And if I go out, I got South Manitou Island. I mean, all gorgeous places, and the sunrises are amazing. <laughs> How long have you been chartering? 18 years. So you've seen a lot in those nearly two decades. You've seen a lot out there on the water. I have seen a lot. We've gone to the height of the salmon fishery when there were so many fish in the lake in 2012 to lows here about six, seven years ago to where we were trying to save the lake because of the Huron crash. I mean, uh, we've got the tribal issues going on. There's just so much going on in our lake, and it changes so fast nowadays. How ha- how how has your approach changed? I mean, it used to be when I started, you know, years ago when I was out there on Lake Michigan, you run some downriggers and maybe a stacker, a slider, and if you were real adventurous, a dipsy. But, man, you guys have, have moved so far beyond that these days. Yeah, they're, I'm not really, I'm still sort of the old-timer type, but the, the coppers off each side and lead cores, well, I run lead core, and uh, I run torpedoes. A lot of people don't run torpedoes. Um Plus riggers, I mean, and the tackle has changed so much, and if you don't stay on top of it, you're probably not catching the amount of fish you should. What's a torpedo? Um, it's a neat little rig. It's a torpedo. It's shaped, and you can bend the tail left or right, and it sort of sets like a dipsy diver, and it sets a lot faster. Um, it's, I like them. <laughs> I've been running them for, I don't know, seven, eight years now. I mean, um, it's like I say, it, it runs just like a dipsy diver. So. You, you said too, you're seeing some, uh, some numbers of some big fish. Now I, I never thought that in my lifetime I would see a new state record King salmon. Of course we saw that last year. Was that, was that, was that an anomaly or are there fish even bigger than what Bobby Sullivan caught out there last summer? Well, I don't know about bigger. It's pretty hard to beat a fish that size. Uh, yeah. I mean, this year with the lake trout down, we fish salmon. I mean, I've been fishing salmon since mid-July up here. Usually we don't start until in the end of August. And, I mean, every trip you were getting a 20 to 25-pound fish or two. And uh, and then the, as they move this way, I mean, you, you get a few more. And, then, and like I say, it was a mixed bag of small, mediums, and larges, which is fantastic to see. So, would, but, would, uh, do it, As a captain, as a charter captain, and the president of the Michigan Charter Board Association, you've got an interesting perspective here. Would you, do you want to see people hook into a 25, 30-pound king, or does that cause so much chaos on the boat you just have seen, just as, just as uh, well see a smaller fish that you can maybe catch more fish in that same period of time? I personally, and this is my personal opinion only, I mean, there are those guys out there that want the monsters. I personally would like to catch more fish of a little bit smaller size, but the other side of the coin is you catch one of those great big monsters and you lay it on the deck floor, uh, it makes your trip. <laughs> I mean, it's a battle. I mean, it's it's... I'm not like a lot of people. I mean, I'll pull one side and I'll go corral that fish. Other people, they just keep going and fight them or break them off. So, yeah, it's. But I like to see that fish on the deck. 
For people who haven't caught a, a Chinook salmon, a king salmon of 25, 30 pounds, it's, uh, it's quite an experience. I mean, it, it could be, for somebody who, isn't, who doesn't spend a lot of time out there like you do, it could be the fish of a lifetime. Oh, it is. I mean, it's, it lights the whole boat up when you land a fish like that. I mean, uh, it's, it's great when you get, like I say, a 12, 14-year-old kid catches a fish like that. Uh, it's a little harder when mom and dad want a 6- or 7-year-old kid to fight a fish like that. I mean, they just don't have the strength and capabilities to fight a fish like that. And the whole goal with me is to try to catch everybody a fish on the boat and when you got smalls, mediums, and larges, I mean, that little kid becomes part of that crew the minute you land one of them three, four pound little kings. I mean, <laughs> you put that in their arms, and I can show you pictures that I've got of those kids just smiles from ear to ear because he caught that fish. Yeah, uh, and for most people, I mean, they don't care. I know what you mean about smiles. I mean, you take somebody out who's not a hardcore fisherman, and you get them a small fish or a medium fish. They don't care. They've got a smile from ear to ear. I, I think this resource that we have out here is a world-class fishery, and, and I think oftentimes guys like you and me maybe take it a little bit for granted. I, I don't take it for granted because I watch it all the time, and even we up here up north target lake trout a lot more than the southern ports do, and, and I've always said, you catch a 10-year-old kid a 10-pound lake trout, and he can put that in his arms to hold I mean, it's his eyeballs are fifty cent pieces. I mean, it, it's awesome to watch. I mean, I it, it makes my day. I'm 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 so glad to hear that. I you know, you and I have been talking throughout the summer, and and you know, as great as the fishery is, and as exciting as it is, and the big fish, you know, on, on my side of the state and your side of the state, there are some concerns right now, Bill. And as as the president of the Michigan Charter Boat Association, you've been in the heart of this situation. I know you can't talk about it extensively, but, but what's going on right now? Say, for example, the consent decree negotiations. There's been some real frustration there with what is perceived to be, from the outside, a lack of progress. Well, um, as the I sit on the board of the Coalition to Protect Michigan Resources, um, we filed a motion to intervene and uh, sort of gotten shot down and dismissed by the judge. And then we filed another motion to become part of the negotiations. And that hearing was last Thursday, and the judge denied us that motion, too. Um, The consent decree is quickly coming to a close um, to where... The judge made a statement that he had hoped to see a final draft by the end of September during that hearing. Um, We, as the amici, will get a chance to review and comment before the judge will sign off on this decree. When we get that privilege, we can go public with everything that is in there. And it's probably going to be a short time frame, and if people want to know what's going on in, on in, in the contents, um, stay tuned, because it's going to happen fast. Bill, hang tight. On that note, listen, I want to continue our conversation, but we've got to take a break here on the Outdoor Magazine Show. We're talking with Captain Bill Winnewicki, uh, the president of the Michigan Charter Boat Association, michigancharterboats.com, michigancharterboats.com. Real quick, Bill, I forgot to ask you, what's the, what's the website for your, your personal charter there? Uh, whatabite.com. Whatabite.com, sure. what a, thank you. Yeah, All right. fishing out of water. Whatabite.com. So michigancharterboats.com or whatabite.com as well. We've got to take a break here. When we come back, more with Captain Bill Winnewicki of the Michigan Charter Boat Association. My concern is, it, you know, when they can finally all go public with this, is it going to be too late? I will ask Bill that question and more after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear 
here at the Outdoor Magazine Show in Alpena on WZTK 105.7 FM. You can hear us in Battle Creek on WBCK 95.3 FM. And you can hear us north of the bridge in Iron Mountain on WMIQ 1450 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Rapid River Knives. As always, I have a Rapid River knife in my pocket right now. In fact, no, it's not in my pocket. It's in my hand now. I love these things. These are handmade pieces of art designed to be used. Uh, Chris Durson and crew at Rapid River Knives are craftsmen. They can make you a a folding pocket knife like I have. They can make you a gutting knife, a skinning knife. They can make you a fillet knife. They can make you a, uh, they can make an ax for you, a hatchet for you, uh, even kitchen knives. Uh, Lifetime guarantees. I would encourage you, if you are in the Yoop near Rapid River, stop by their showroom on uh, just outside of town on US2. And if you can't make it to the shop, go to the website, rapidriverknifeworks.us, rapidriverknifeworks.us. You will see what I mean. You can order a knife online. You can have it custom engraved for you. Uh, really great products. So these, are, these are something you can pass down for generations, rapidriverknifeworks.us. While you are online, head on over to whatabite.com. That's the website of Captain Bill Winnewicki. Yeah, uh, um, a long-term veteran, long-time veteran charter captain on Northern Lake, Michigan. And also check out the website michigancharterboats.com. That's the website of the Michigan Charter Boat Association, a group of which I am a member. Uh, Bill, before the break, we were talking about the consent decree negotiations. Without going into too much detail, this is the, this is the, um, this is the process by which every 20 years we find out what the relationship is for the catch between the tribal anglers and the sport and and commercial fishermen, right? That is correct. Um, there's more to it than that of course. in this decree, but I cannot comment. So, Well, you, you, you got me nervous. In fact, you got me a little bit scared. Between you and MUCC and the things we're hearing about what's going on with this and the DNR, um, I'm concerned, Bill. You have the right to be very concerned, Mike, and everybody who listens to you has the right to be very concerned. This thing will be released to the public when we get our hands on it, but the state will release it before we do. And I would suspect it will be painted very pretty and perfect, and it's not that bad. That's what you're going to get. But uh, I will say that since the falling out between us and the state in June. We have not received any updated documents to date that are, we've received documents, but they're outdated. And uh, the communication between the state negotiating team and the Mikai, the sports fishermen, is pretty null. Well, I, I feel like we're being sold out. Listen, I'm not a part of this, obviously. I'm just going by what I hear, right? But I feel like we're being sold out by the state. And by the time this comes to light, what's in this thing, what are we going to be able to do, Bill? I, It's up to our legal team. I suspect when we get the documents, we are going to go after the high points the big ones um, once we start reviewing it. I, I don't think we, I mean, because we have to present our, 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 our disagreements or our comments to the judge, and he is going to want to read a whole pile of stuff. And I don't know what the outcome will be. Safe to, mean, it's safe to say the future is going to look different than what we've been working under for the past 20 years? Very very different um depending what the tribes do with it um they i don't suspect they want to have issues like the 1980s with the sports fishermen yeah yeah but i'll leave it at that (laughs) um now, is this something, though, that is going to affect just you guys as charter captains, professional anglers, or is this going to affect the recreational anglers and the weekend warriors, too? This will affect all anglers 
Munising and Lake Superior to Alpena and Lake Huron to the Grand River and Grand Haven. That's that's, that's, a, that's a lot of water. A lot of water, but those are tribal seeded waters by the five tribes, and there will be an effect on Joe Blow, the guy with the 17 footer, to the charter industry. And then the boat manufacturers and the lure dealers and what have you, depending on what the outcome is. Like I say, we have not seen the updated documents. Well, Bill, this, uh, all, all we can do at this point, and, and I'm, I'm out of time, and really there's not that much more we can talk about anyway that you can disclose, but um, keep an eye. Keep an eye out for things. MUCC will be putting something out there as soon as this is available. DNR will put their version out. You guys will put uh, information out. I will, of course, share whatever you guys and MUCC and the various groups have out there. So all we can do at this point is just keep an eye on the news, keep an eye on social media, and when there is more, we will get that information out as quick as we can, right? That is correct, and I do want the public to stand by because we really need their support financially and their voices now. Uh, good point. Good point. I'll talk more about that uh, financial assistance as well. It, it, listen, it's, it's taken a lot of money to fight this thing, and uh, the groups fighting it don't have deep pockets, so they can use your help. Uh, anyway, uh, whatabite.com is Captain Bill Winnewicki's uh, website for his charter uh, company, and the Michigan Charter Boats, michigancharterboats.com, the website for the Michigan Charter Boat Association. We'll take a break. When we come back, wrap up this first hour with Tom Campbell of Woods and Water News. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show and Carol on WKYL 1360 AM and WIDL 92.1 FM. You can hear us in Sheboygan on Big Country Gold AM and FM 1240 AM 100.7 FM. And you can hear us north of the bridge in the Sioux on News Talk 1400 WKNW. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Versa Skins. Just change your skin for the season you're in. Michigan-based Versa Skins has come up with a system where you buy one good quality set of hunting clothes, and then you snap on and zip on an outer liner of whatever camo pattern you want. And the transition takes like maybe a minute, no more than that. Uh, the website versaskins.com. That's versaskins.com. And you can see Paul Perone, the owner of Versa Skins, at the Big Woods and Water Outdoor Weekend coming up next weekend in Imlay City. That show is put on, by, as it has been for more than three decades, by the folks at Woods and Water News and Tom Campbell with us now to talk about that. Tom, how are you? Have you had a chance Mike, to breathe, eat, sleep, <laughs> or do anything the last couple of weeks? We don't have to. No, it's uh, we're excited. We're so excited. It's finally here. It, it seems to drag that first, and then all of a sudden, it's September and it's here. So we're excited about it. And I think we got a great show lined up. Like you said, we've got quality vendors coming like versus skins and, and we're excited about that when I mean, we can throw in there that you know retail places like frank's will be there and cabela's and bass pro and vf sports and randy's hunting center so you know if there's something you're looking for you'll probably find it at the outdoor weekend at the uh eastern michigan fairgrounds in Emily city september 9th 10th and 11th and this is a buying show, right? If somebody's looking for new yeah. gear or equipment, you can yeah. walk away from the fairgrounds with it in your hands. Absolutely right. That's right, Mike. You, you, you from from little parts to three thousand dollar blinds. We we've, we've got it all in there. Walking out with it, there's everything from ATVs to boats. So, yeah, whatever you're looking for the outdoors, you can walk away with it that weekend. As long as you get the money. That's, <laughs> that's, right, that's right. Minor <laughs> detail. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And and, um, and, and aside mm. from you know uh, getting gear and equipment. Uh, information, right. uh, the, the seminars, oh, the, the displays, the demonstrations. You got it. You got it, Mike. We got some, you know, just to hit on some of the highlights of things that we've got. We've got educational things. We've got uh, uh, the Heritage Church puts on a kids' archery instructional shoot, and they'll help kids 
starting out in archery and getting the basics down. And, and then on top of that, we've got seven ponds that come with a lot of kids' stuff. And just to keep the kids occupied, we also always throw in a climbing wall and some games for them to keep them going. But, and then they can also get over to and meet and greet some raptors this year. We've got some great – the Michigan Hawking Club's coming back, and they all have all different kinds of raptors on display along with the aviation, Michigan Aviate experience. They'll bring a bald eagle and talk to people about it. Uh, so, that, you know, it's all – it's just a great informative place to be and on top of that like we've mentioned um, we also get a lot of going on with the fishing part of the uh, outdoors too and uh, one popular place is terry mcburney who does a sporting collectibles and is very knowledgeable on antique lures and it seems like every year somebody brings a lure from their grandfather's tackle box that's worth thousands of dollars mm. so and terry's there to to do that just that he'll, he'll evaluate he'll look at he'll if he can't figure out what it's worth he'll he'll suggest people to to find so that's another part of it and uh and then there's all kinds of demonstrations going on. We've we've got chainsaw demonst- chainsaw carving demonstrations going on the entire weekend. Reg Pettibone and his family come up and they talk about the culture and dances of the Ho Chunk Nation, Indian, Native Americans. So they're there the Saturday, Sunday. Um, new this year and kind of unique to, for that part of the outdoor population that plays cribbage at camp every year, whatever it's a fishing camp or hunting camp. We've got some of the world best, the nation's best, the state best cribbage players coming to the outdoor weekend. Now that is and interesting. They're willing to ah. share their tips, and you can even challenge them at the, uh, and they'll take place at what we call the at the Rotary Beer Tent, the big dome in the middle of the fairgrounds, and you can jump in and and talk to them. They all have a display of cribbage boards, and and you can even play them. And, and uh, so that's kind of kind of neat, something a little different. I think it's cool. Uh, beer tent, yeah. so so beer and cribbage. You beer. can't get more Michigan than that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Throw in an elk burger <laughs> or a venison burger. A little, little euchre right, and you're Mike. covered. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. How about, so, okay, yeah. so before we let you go into the, the details, specifics, where, when, how much, right. parking, all that good stuff. You got it. So we are September 9th, 10th, and 11th. Friday, we go from 3 o'clock in the afternoon till 9 at night. Saturday, 9 o'clock in the morning till 7 and then Sunday, 9 to 5, it's $10, free parking. Kids 12 and under are free as well, so we don't charge the kids. And you can find everything you want to do, want as far as times for uh, – we didn't even get to talk about the fantastic seminars we have on deer hunting. And you can find that online at uh, www.outdoorweekend.net to make it easy for you. All right. The website, uh, outdoorweekend.net, outdoorweekend.net. The website, Woods and Water News, woods-n-waternews.com. Tom Campbell, have a great time. I wish, I, I will hope that the, the weather holds for you. And even if it doesn't, you're going to have a great time. That's the uh, Woods and Water News Outdoor Weekend. Uh, coming up next weekend in Emily City, the website outdoorweekend.net. We'll take a break for the top of the hour. When we come back, we continue to get ready for the fall hunting season with Rob Miller talking about using track and dogs for the uh, youth hunt coming up here real soon and the regular season as well. Dr. Megan Moriarty talking about uh, avian flu for the waterfall hunters and this week's Ask Avery segment. That and more coming up in hour two of this week's Outdoor Magazine. Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Eider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, Brenton USA Hunting Rifles, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Well, thank you, uh, Ken Hunter, for that introduction. I do certainly appreciate it. And welcome to our number two of this week's Outdoor Magazine radio show here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network, heard on more than 30 radio stations across the great state of Michigan. Yes, this is first and foremost a radio show. And I say that to make the distinction between 
how this show is recorded, distributed, produced, and syndicated as opposed to the many, 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 many outdoor podcasts that are out there these days. There aren't many, in fact, you could count them on less than one hand, statewide syndicated Michigan-based outdoor radio shows. But there are a whole bunch of outdoor podcasts. I do think the best way to listen to Outdoor Magazine Radio, if you can, is on your local radio station. You get your local news, weather, sports, even your local ads. Maybe there's a sale or something you want to take advantage of. Plus, the radio stations get the content of the show before the podcast is made available. Um, and yes, there is a podcast of the show. Listen, I, have, I don't want to mislead you. I have nothing against podcasting at all. I love podcasting. I think it's a great way. It would be a great way for you. If you have a story to tell, if you have something you want to get across, if you want to have, if you want to educate, inform, entertain people, you can do it with a podcast. It's very easy. That's why it's so popular these days. Very easy to do. You could put a podcast together on your phone and have people listening to it within a week. Well, actually within a couple of days. So I love podcasting. And that's why I make a podcast version of the radio show available each week. You can hear the podcast on my website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com, on my Facebook page, on Amazon Music, Audible, Twitter, LinkedIn, the, the whole gamut. I mean, everywhere, including YouTube even. So be sure to check that out if you are into podcasting. I also, speaking of podcasting and some blatant self-promotion here, I do uh, podcasts every month for Offshore Tackle, Angler Quest Boats, Primal Tree Stands, and Polar Craft Boats. And when we're done with this week's uh, recording of the Outdoor Magazine radio show, we will record this month's Primal Podcast. So keep an ear out for that as well. Regardless of how you are hearing my voice, when you are hearing my voice, whatever format, whatever download, whatever streaming, whatever radio station, I do appreciate it. You know, at the beginning of the show, uh, Ken Hunter says, I've been doing this for more than 40 years. I have. And it is a real blessing and an honor for me to be able to do this. It's not something I take lightly. Um, I, I try to make every week's show as good as I can. I try to get the best guests for you that I can. And I think because I have been around for quite a while, and I do know quite a few people, and I'm, I'm able to reach quite a few people, that we have some success with that. Rob Miller is a guy I love talking with, especially this time of year. As we're getting ready for the fall hunting seasons, as the youth hunt is coming up next, season, er, er, next weekend, Rob is a guy who, in my opinion pioneered the use of tracking dogs to recover wounded animals. These are animals hit by a hunter that were not immediately recovered by the hunter. Um, Rob and his tracking dogs can help you out. Now, there are a bunch of trackers and tracking dogs across our state now, and that's great. That's great news for hunters. But again, in my opinion, Rob is the guy who helped pioneer this whole thing, and he's with us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Uh, Rob, welcome back to the show. How are you? I'm doing well, Mike. I do appreciate once again having me on, and uh, hopefully we can educate and have an entertaining show. Well, you are uh, uh, number one. You're about recovering wounded animals, but you're you're very interested in um, in educating hunters, aren't you? I, I love educating hunters. I also love educating all these new trackers that we have in our state. I think once everyone's educated, everyone's more is uh, successful, and then we're all happy. Yeah, it's the goal here is such a great goal: uh, minimize non-recovered game, maximize hunter opportunities, and and the ability to put some venison or bear or whatever it is on the table. Yes, exactly. Hmm. So tell me, um, how did remind us, Rob? How did you get into this? Because you were one of the first. Yeah, so I don't know if she is back in early 2000s. I wounded a, a deer with my with my bow, hunting public land. It was, you know, at that time was a mature buck for me, and and I was doing everything I possibly could to re- recover this deer. And you know, the human resources ran in to the end, and next thing you know, I'm like, well, let's try a dog. So I started calling archery shops, anybody and everybody, and there just was no dogs available. 
or no one even available close to me, let's just say that. But really, I think there was two guys back in the day that was doing it. Bill Yoder is the one that I, I got a hold of back then, and uh, Bill has since passed away. But Bill was kind of one of our first trackers in our state. Um, you may remember, Bill, he had uh, the deer show, oh, yeah. uh, the deer show he's all around our state. Sure. So Bill, Bill was kind of my first mentor that I actually got to talk to. And then ever since then, I've been hooked. Well, at, at one time, uh, just before you started, it was illegal to take a dog into the woods to search for uh, a wounded game. Yeah, yeah. I, I never realized when it became legal, but it was like I think five years, six years before I started tracking when it got legalized. So how does this work? I mean, walk me through the basics. A hunter, listen, I want to get this out to the people listening who are not hunters. It yeah. is the goal of every ethical hunter, and I believe most hunters are extremely ethical. It is the goal of every hunter to make a quick, clean, humane killing shot, to put that animal down as quickly as possible. But it doesn't always happen and then sometimes we need to turn for help, and, and more recently it's been the use of a dog. How does this work, Rob? Well, let's start with shot placement. Everyone thinks tracking dogs are used on bad shot placements, and that's not true. A lot of the shots are actually great shot placements due to deflections or maybe the, the angle of the deer. The entrance shot is beautiful, and a lot of guys see my photos like, you really need a dog on that when it looks like it's a 12-ring shot? Well, they don't know where the arrow exited. And, and there's where it lies the problems. When you run an arrow through a, a white tail or a bear and it goes more the whole length of the body, you have the hide can slide covering the holes, you have deflections happen. Many things happen with an arrow, even bullets, and simply don't have much of a blood trail. Or the deer does take a little longer to expire than we planned. The hunter tracks too soon, pushes the animal who knows how much further, and then at that point, the hunter's just scratching their head thinking, there's no way I can visually follow this scent trail or the trail. Let's use a nose and, and the nose knows. So that's kind of how we're all getting going with this. So at what point should a hunter call in a tracking dog? In your experience, do people wait too long or do they jump on this too early? What's, what's, what's the best way of going about it? Well, the best part, Mike, is you've done a great job of promoting this and hunters are calling us much sooner than before. So I would like to say before, yeah, hunters were waiting too long. But due to education, your show, Facebook, everything, hunters are calling us in great timeline, so the scent trail is optimum for our canines. What's best for a hunter is when you get down or when you see your shot or when you find your arrow or when you first look at the blood trail and you know something's not right, I think that's a great time to reach out to your local tracker just say, hey, here's what I'm looking at. Let me see your educated opinion because, like myself, I go on 100, 150 tracks a year. Many hunters only do that in a lifetime. Yeah. And I've been doing this. This is my 15th year. So I like to say I've seen hundreds, if not thousands, of different types of blood trails sign evidence. So I can say, Mike, here's your situation, what you're telling me. Here's my educated opinion on how to move forward if it's with or without a dog. So, at what, I mean, do we wait, I realize I'm asking the same question again, but do we wait no, overnight? Do we wait a certain number of hours? What, what if the rain is coming in? That changes things too, right? Yeah, so let's look at the first aspect. When was the animal shot? Was it a high pressure or low pressure? That has a major effect on how long that scent trail will last. Really? If it's, high, if it's a high pressure, that scent trail is instantly going straight up into the atmosphere. Now, once the nightfall sets in, the atmosphere changes and the pressure changes, that scent trail will then come back down and relax and settle down. So depending on your shot placement, that deer may only need four hours to, to, before we put a dog on it, may need 24 hours if, let's say, it's an intestine shot or stomach shot. But maybe you just simply, unfortunately, broke a deer's leg. Well, we don't want that deer laying out there for 24 hours crippled and injured in pain. We want to get on that deer as soon as possible to track it, get up there and use our, our Michigan registration, legalized where a hunter can bring the weapon with the dog and end suffering right then and there. So I think it has to do with shot placement, um, you know, liver shots, 8 to 12 hours, stomach shots, we like to say 18 to 24 hours, broken leg, shoulder shots, maybe non-lethal shots, track immediately, 
those are kind of some timelines. We're talking with Rob Miller, uh, in my opinion, the guy who helped um, really raise awareness about uh, using a tracking dog to recover wounded animals here in Michigan. You can find Rob on Facebook at Miller Deer Tracking, Miller Deer Tracking. We've got to take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. But as you can imagine, I have a lot more questions for Rob, and he is the guy to answer them, especially now with the youth hunt coming up next weekend. you got bear season coming up. You know, we think about using a dog to track deer, but can you track bears with them as well? Well, Rob is the guy to ask. Lots of questions coming up again. Rob Miller of Miller Deer Tracking. You can find him on Facebook, Miller Deer Tracking. We'll take a break. Lots more coming up right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show all across the great state of Michigan, including St. Joe, WSJM 94.9 FM, over in Tawas, WIOS 1480 AM 106.9 FM, and in Traverse City, WTCM 580 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Brenton USA Hunting Rifles, AR-style, highly accurate uh, rifles that could change the way you look at an AR as a viable hunting uh, rifle. They're made in Lansing, just down the street from the governor's office. I love that. Uh, boy, calibers from 450 Bushmaster right on down into these uh, 22 caliber uh, Predator rounds. Um, I uh, sighted in and broke in my Brenton last week, a 350 Legend, to get it ready for the youth hunt. My grandson Carter is going to use it next weekend for the youth hunt, youth hunt and then I'm going to use it for my Michigan bear hunt. I really um, am excited to, to use this gun, learn more about the platform, and uh, to get better with this gun, spend some quality time with it. The website, BrentonUSA.com. That's BrentonUSA.com. Right now we're talking with Rob Miller of uh, Miller's Deer Track, and you can find him on Facebook. Um, Rob, a couple of questions. Uh, can you use a tracking dog to recover bears or elk in addition to deer? Yes, yes, we sure can. Uh, last year we were able to help uh, Vanessa Shook up in the Alpena area recover a beautiful black bear uh, with my dog Sergeant. Uh, it's really interesting following Sergeant on that track. It, when these dogs, or at least my dogs, track bear, they track with a whole different attitude, enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, almost, with, you know, they know they're tracking an apex predator. Wow. But they still continue to do it. Uh, I've tracked many elk. Unfortunately, I have yet to recover an elk. Um, tracking elk with the dogs is completely different. The scent trail is so wide, it almost looks like our dogs are confused when tracking, but they're really just tracking in really wide zigzags, hitting the, the outer edges of the scent cone, which also the cone of the scent is what tells our dogs the direction they need to go. So it's fascinating tracking all these species, but yeah, we can handle them all. And you heard me talk about the, you know my upcoming uh, gun hunts. Is there a difference tracking uh, a firearm shot critter versus a bow shot critter? I believe the, the difference I would say is when a deer is bro- has, or an animal has a broken leg with a firearm, they put off a ton of injured scent. Where an arrow in the broken category don't seem to put off as much injured scent. So firearms, I believe, do put off way more scent, or the, the deer is way more injured, and the dogs are able to track them with more accuracy. So, what's the longest track you've been on and actually recovered the animal, or? were able to confirm that the animal was alive? Our oldest track was 56 hours. Then we made it 800 yards to a bed with a, with a dab of blood in it, and we never recovered the deer, but the deer was seen again later alive. Uh, the longest recovery where we found the animal dead was probably right around 1.2, 1.3 miles on a 24-hour-old untouched stomach shot. So this deer was not pushed by a human, but it still went over a mile. Wow, they're tough, aren't they? I mean, uh, uh, one thing this has to learn, uh, you know, anybody who's tracked an animal, these critters and their will to survive and their toughness is just amazing. And, and a lot of it has to do with what time of the year the animal shot. If you shoot a buck during the rut and he's fully rut crazed, 
these deer are they're almost zombies they they almost i don't believe they feel pain they're not chemically right and you track a buck during the rut and they're going to drive you crazy because they're literally covering every inch of the property you'll be doing loop-de-loops it's just amazing tracking a rut crazed buck versus an early season or late season deer it's completely different are your dogs you mentioned scent a couple of times i used to think they were just tracking blood but it's more than that isn't it yeah, and you know, it just recently, Mike, I've also learned where we always thought it was the interdigital gland uh, that's located in the deer's hoof. But talking with my buddies in Texas, Dustin Machado, he tracks a lot of exotics where they don't actually have the interdigital gland. So him and I have been really brainstorming, like, well, what are these dogs really tracking? And I and we believe there's two things they're really focused on: the breath of that particular animal, and also the scent that's coming off that body of that deer or whatever it is because they're mentally chemically changing so their skin raft skin cells that are falling off their animal is at a much higher rapid rate versus a normal healthy calm animal so i believe those are the two factors is the skin cells and the breath and then any body fluids that come out so the blood is just a bonus just a bonus and i think for us handlers to say yeah our dogs are doing their job <laughs> What kind of dogs are you running, Rob? So right now, my uh, my main dog, he's seven years old, a Slavinsky Kopa from Slovakia. He's a 45-pound, looks like a miniature black and tan hound. And then I have two up-and-coming dogs. One's a year and a half. One's nine months old. They're Atlantish Dashbrax from Austria. And, again, they're about a 40-pound red. They're kind of a reddish dog. And... They're almost like miniature bloodhounds. They just have exceptionally great noses, great IQ, and I'm really excited to see this breed, um, you know, grow and prosper into what I'm hoping they can be. These are a little bigger dogs than Cypress then, right? Yeah, yeah. I went to the larger breed. Um, there's nothing wrong with a dash hound. I would highly recommend them to probably 99% of the people to run a dash hound. They're, they're, they're just so easy to train, easy to handle, easy in the house, easy in the car, and they love to track. But as much tracking as I do, I just need more horsepower, more leg power, more stamina, and, and the dash on just does not fit my style anymore. So when you pull up on the scene, you talk to the hunter, you do a little debrief, can, can the dog run wild in front of you, or do they have to be on a leash? The state still requires our dog to be leashed. Uh, th- there's no said length of that leash. I, I run a 30-foot leash. I also do run a GPS system just in case the leash gets out of my hands if I trip and fall. You know, there's so many, many aspects where you may fall, and I cannot rely on, hey, dog, stop, or a whistle, where I have my dog's e-collar trained, so if I do fall or whatever, I can get them back on GPS. It's also great to record the track so you can see where you've been. Um, You know, if the SEAL wants to investigate things, yeah, I can clearly tell you weren't trespassing because you have your GPS coordinates of where you've been. So I run both GPS and long line, but the state still requires us dogs to be leashed, which, Mike, I don't understand why we can hunt everything with dogs off leash, but to go find something laying dead in the woods, we still require a leash. I just don't get it. Well, I I guess now that you bring it up, I don't get it either. Speaking of... Having a a dog working freedom, like a bird dog, right? Yeah. They they work naturally in freedom. You're going to get the best work out of your bird dog. Same with our tracking dogs. I do training off-season, and and I let the leash drag and things like that. And my dogs work so much better when there's not restraint on them, but we still got to obey the laws. Well, sure, yeah. I mean, and that's got to be kind of frustrating for a dog, too. He's like, man, man, let's go, let's go, let's go. And you're back there trying to get through the brush, and you're holding them up. Yes, or get a stick in your eye Uh, or, you know, a thorn in your legs. It's just a mess. hmm. So speaking of legalities, now, are you guys licensed as trackers? So legalities is a great question. If you look online, it makes it look like you have to be registered to the state of Michigan. You don't. All you need to do is have a dog ban on a leash, have landowner's permission, and anyone can track in our state of Michigan. Now, if you want to be able to carry a weapon of season with the dog, you then have to go through passing the United Blood Trackers test, get your concealed pistol license, submit the information to the DNR Law Division, they will then grant you one annual year permission to track. And at that point, you have to call the report all poaching line, say, hey, I'm Mike Avery, here's where I'm tracking for, I'm tracking for Rob Miller, here's his information, here's our location, 
And then when you're done tracking, you have to call back in and say, hey, I'm closing out the track. There was no recovery. Or, yes, there was a recovery. Or if we had to dispatch, we have to you know let them know that we dispatched. So are you, as the tracker, the one who finishes off the animal, or is the hunter allowed to? Only the hunter can... The hunter can do the dispatching in Michigan. The licensed hunter can dispatch. The only time I can fire my CPL is under CPL laws for my safety or protecting my dog. So let's say I'm tracking a bear and the bear comes and charges and and, and is going to try to kill my dog. I could at that point then pull my handgun out and try to defend my dog. Oh, gotcha. But... But during the archery season, then, even if the bow hunter has a concealed carry permit, he's got to use the bow to finish the animal off. Yes, weapon of season. Weapon of season is a key part. And we can do it day and night. We can, you know, during archery season, we find your deer, and we have, we have the spotlight on the deer laying there, and you can pull your crossbow up, cock it, put a bolt in it, and dispatch it. Yeah, because you can't have that crossbow loaded while you're out tracking before you find the animal. Nope, nothing can be loaded. No arrows can be on the strings. It just has to just carry your weapon, and then we'll load it and, and get get everyone safe and then do the dispatch. I, I just think it's it's pretty cool, though, what what this has become. You know, it started out with Bill Yoder, who was just kind of playing around the fringes. You embraced it. You promoted it. And now you look across the state. There are deer trackers everywhere. Um, how do we find a good, legitimate tracker because like everything else i'm sure there are people out there who maybe don't do as good a job as others just because we're dealing with human beings how do we find the right person well i think you know i know i like to say i like to know everybody in our state that tracks i don't but i probably know 99 percent of them so i would say recommend call myself or we have the michigan deer tracking network which is a large group that we've developed where it's kind of a central hub for trackers to go or hunters to go in and learn what tracker is in their area. Um, A lot of trackers will, you know, if you call me and you say, I'm over here, we're going to say, this is the guy I recommend first. And then you're going to go down the list of experience until we get you help. So there's a lot of new trackers that I don't want to say a new team is a bad team because there's some outstanding young pups and outstanding teams. Sure. But typically when you have a guy that's got five, six, seven, 10, 15 years of experience, you're going to get a more, probably get your expectations filled versus having someone show up green, you know, you you may leave frustrated. So this Michigan Deer Tracking Network, is this is this a website or is this a Facebook page or both? It's currently, we have a Facebook page, and we also have a website. Okay, so so this is the time of year right now, then. I would encourage hunters to go to this and get the resources, see who's in your area, and get ready for the season. Rob, appreciate your time. I uh, have a good season coming up. I hope I don't have to call you, but if I get in a situation where I do, I will not hesitate. I appreciate it, Mike. I wish you the best on your bear hunt. I appreciate that, too. Thank you. Rob Miller of uh, Miller Deer Tracking and the uh, Michigan Deer Tracking Network as well. Uh, We'll take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. When we come back, avian flu. I haven't heard about it for a while. I thought it was all over with. No, Dr. Megan Moriarty says it's still a concern, and it's something that waterfowl hunters should be aware of. And in this week's Ask Avery segment about the concept of hunting with an AR-15 in our number two of Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Houghton Lake on the Twister 92.1 WTWS. You can also hear us out of Houghton Lake on Blowtorch, powerful station 98.5 WUPS. And you can hear us in Holland on WHTC 1450 AM and 99.7 FM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Michigan-based Boning Archery. Boning, a leader in the archery industry for, what, 76 years now? More than three-quarters of a century? They started out with feral tight to glue uh, broadheads to wooden, uh, wooden arrow shafts. These days, look what they're doing now with the blazer veins and such and continue to evolve and improve. And I will uh, bet that you are, if you are a, a, an archer, either a target archer or a bow hunter, you are using boning products somewhere. If not, I would suggest you take a look at them. 
innovation after three quarters of a century, a leader in the archery industry, and they're based right here in Michigan. How cool is that? Check them out online at boning.com. That's B-O-H-N-I-N-G, boning.com. Last, uh, I think it was spring, maybe May, <clears throat> we had Dr. Megan Moriarty on the show to talk about avian flu. And I thought, I thought it was gone. I thought it was taken care of. I thought it had disappeared. But the folks at DNR tell me that it is still a concern and maybe a concern for waterfall hunters this fall. So uh, Dr. Moriarty is back with us once again. Uh, Doc, welcome back to the show. How are you? Oh, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. So tell me why, first of all, is this a concern? Is it something that's still out there? Yes, unfortunately, uh, the highly pathogenic avian influenza is still present in Michigan, and we expect it to still be around this fall, similar to um, its emergence in uh, Michigan in the springtime. So we did issue some guidance for waterfowl hunters to um, continue their vigilance and exercise some precautions when hunting this fall. So what are those guidelines? So um, the first is to not harvest any sick appearing or um, unhealthy looking waterfowl. Um, we really don't recommend anyone um, directly handle or eat sick game in general, but particularly during this outbreak, it's a good idea to really only harvest healthy appearing waterfowl. Um, we also recommend that hunters field dress and prepare game outside or in a well-ventilated area and use some precautions like wearing a glove, when handling and cleaning game, and then also thoroughly washing hands, um, kind of not touching your, your face um, or eating or drinking or smoking while handling carcasses. Um, and then, of course, thoroughly cooking all game meat is important. And um, if waterfowl are hunted, I'm sorry, if waterfowl are cooked to an internal temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit, that should kill the virus and make it safe to consume. So this, based on your recommendations, it sounds to me like this can be transferred to humans. Humans can get sick from this? That's a great question. Um, it is what's called a zoonotic disease, which means that it has potential to impact uh, human beings. Fortunately, the risk is still considered quite low. Um, there's only been a single case um, in a human in the United States during this outbreak, and that was a poultry worker that was involved in depopulating um, a heavily infected commercial flock. So the risk um, for that individual was quite high because they were in an environment where there was a lot of virus. Um, for the general public, the risk is considered low, but it's still important to take some prevention uh, measures so that we can continue to um, enjoy wildlife and go outdoors uh, while still keeping ourselves safe. Gotcha. Why, you know, why, why, why take the chance, I guess. So the concern yeah. is primarily, though, that this is in the bird population. I thought it was just in songbirds. I didn't realize it was in game birds and waterfowl, too. Yeah, there are certain groups of birds that are more susceptible to this virus. Um, it's called highly pathogenic because it's particularly um, deadly for domestic uh, poultry, but a lot of wild birds are also um, infected, and some of them can exhibit signs, clinical signs, and can die from the disease. So uh, um, a lot of raptors, um, particularly bald eagles, have been really impacted, and then waterfowl also, um, so geese and and ducks um, are also quite impacted. Um, some of them are asymptomatic. They don't show any signs, but they can spread the disease. Um, but other individuals do actually die from the infection. Um, so songbirds are actually one of the lower risk groups. Um, but raptors and waterfowl and also uh, avian scavengers are, are highly susceptible. So that includes you know, vultures and gulls and terns, and those are some of the groups of birds that we think of when we think of this virus. Is it, is it to the point where you are concerned about it knocking down waterfowl numbers to the point where we as hunters and just bird watchers would, would notice it? That's a great question. At this time, we don't have any imminent concerns about this impacting the overall um, population health of, um, of waterfowl. Um, you know, these, these populations are pretty robust, and um, certainly some birds do survive infection. Um, but it's something that we're watching. Um, there's a lot of 
uh, information that's still unfolding as to these kind of larger population level effects of this virus. Doctor, appreciate your insight and input and uh, knowledge. And uh, I hope we don't have to talk about this soon uh, again. But if we do, we'll bring you back on. And I appreciate your time today. Okay, thank you. Dr. Megan Moriarty, the website michigan.gov slash DNR, michigan.gov slash DNR. We'll take a break here. When we come back, we'll wrap up the second hour with this week's Ask Avery segment. I've been getting a lot of questions from people about, you know, we hear you talking about you're going to do some hunting this fall with this AR-15. Isn't that an assault rifle? What's this all about? So I don't pretend to be a firearm expert, but I can address these questions as they pertain to me. And I will do that coming up after the break in this week's Ask Avery segment right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Manistee and WMLQ 97.7 FM. You can hear us on the other side of the state, on the other side of the state, in Port Huron, WPHM 1380 AM. And let's go north. Let's go north. Uh, let's go to Newberry, WNBY 1450 AM, where I will be uh, bear hunting here in just a few weeks, very near Newberry with Johnny Bowler, the bear whisperer. Which leads me to the um, Ask Avery segment. The Ask Avery segment is brought to you each week by Security Credit Union. Security Credit Union loves to work with outdoors men and women, and they can help you with your next outdoor adventure. Check them out online at securitycu.org. That's securitycu.org. Now, the way the Ask Avery segment works is this is your chance to be involved in the content of the show. You can ask me a question something you want me to answer directly, something you would like me to pass along to, say, the DNR or MUCC or somebody that maybe you can't reach that possibly I can. Um, And the best way to get these questions to me is to send me an email, mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com. That's mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com. You know, there's a lot of different social media messaging platforms, and I've had people submit questions there, and sometimes I get them, but to be honest with you, sometimes I don't. Because it's just a little bit overwhelming. So send me an email, Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. Now, this week's um, topic doesn't come from just one question, but from uh, one person, but from several people. And it's about this concept of using an AR style, an AR platform rifle to hunt with. Now, AR does not mean assault rifle. It means Armalite. It does not mean assault rifle. But if you listen to the to the, uh, what do they call it now, the legacy media, the, the you know, I'm thinking TV news at this point, they'll have you believe that this is an evil assault rifle that has only one purpose, and that is to hurt people. I will guarantee you that my AR rifle will never hurt anybody. The rifle itself can't do it, and I won't do it. So that's, that's a moot point there, right? The way I, and, and listen, I, I have... Well, I'll tell you right now, at this point, I have three ARs. I have two of the more traditional defense-style AR rifles because I got them because I figured I better get them before you can't get them. My most recent AR is a, is a straight-up hunting tool. It's, it's a Brenton USA uh, 350 Legend, and I, I got it to hunt bear and to hunt deer with. In fact, my grandson Carter is going to use it next weekend in the uh, youth hunt. People say, well, you know, it, why an AR to hunt with? And I guess my question is, well, why not? There are lots of great choices out there. You know, you can get a single shot gun. You can get a bolt action. You can get a lever action. You can get a semi-auto. You can get uh, wood stocks. You can get composite stocks. You can get blued barrels. You can get coated barrels. I mean, just I don't think there is a bad choice for a hunting tool if you are comfortable with it and you are accurate with it. And I'm not about to say that this AR is any better option than the gun that you have right now or the guns that I've used in the past. Um, I, I used to shoot, I used to hunt with Thompson Center guns, and those are single shot break action, break action guns that you could swap barrels out. And that was, you know, that's almost kind of a leaning towards a very simple uh, style of an AR. An AR is like, in fact, I was thinking last night. 
I was thinking this is like a tinker toy for adults, but most of you don't know what tinker toys are, right? So think of it as Legos. It's like a, a, a shooting Lego for adults. The reason I am fascinated with it, a couple of reasons. Number one, I am, I am drawn to tools that are under attack. I, I started shooting a crossbow because a lot of traditional bow hunters in Michigan thought it was an evil tool. Well, I thought, well, is it evil? I'm going to find out. And it wasn't. It isn't. AR is not an evil weapon. It is a tool just like anything else. I like it because it's a semi-auto gun. It's not automatic. People say, oh, an AR is automatic. It's not. It's semi-auto. When you pull the trigger, it fires once. If you want to shoot again, you have to pull the trigger again. So it's semi-auto. I like the fact that it's a pretty tough platform. I mean, ARs in general are designed to be used and abused and misused, right? I won't do that to this Brenton, but they're pretty tough. Uh, this gun is extremely accurate. Now, uh, not all AR-style guns are necessarily sub-MOA, minute of angle. Uh, this Brenton, they say, is. It's more accurate than I'm going to need, right? Now, the concept of, well, it looks scary. It looks like a machine gun. It looks like an assault rifle. But think about this. The bolt-action guns that so many people hunt with, those were at one time considered, I hate to use the term, but I will, weapons of war, right? They were designed to be used by the military. Uh, Semi-auto guns in general, uh, the military has used them for years. So why am I using this AR style? Well, for one thing, the people from Brenton said, we'd like you to take a look at this gun, and if interested, would you work with us? And I thought, a Michigan-based company? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. It's a great gun. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm more than interested. Let's, let's do something together. So I, I'm looking at it from that perspective. I want to show an AR in a positive light as a legitimate hunting tool. Extremely accurate, tough, dependable, reliable, and a lifetime guarantee. Why not? I'm pretty excited about it, actually. Being a guy who is primarily a bow hunter, I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, thanks to our friends from Security Credit Union for making each week's Ask Avery segment possible. Check them out online at securitycu.org. That's securitycu.org. And I will be posting uh, online about Carter's whitetail hunt and my upcoming uh, bear hunt as well on my social media outlets. We'll take a break for the top of the hour. When we come back, more bear hunting with Richard P. Smith in Hour 3 of this week's Outdoor Magazine. Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show. Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Eider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, Brenton USA Hunting Rifles, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Indeed, this is the big guy, Mike Avery. Thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to hour number three of this week's Outdoor Magazine radio show. Four decades, 40 years. It's a long time, and I'm blessed to be able to do it. During those 40-plus years, though, I've had a chance to really meet and talk and get to know a, a, a lot of people. That's one of the coolest things about this job. Not the, not the places that I had a chance to go when I was doing the TV show and not the adventures that I had to, you know, got to experience, which, which was fun, which was great. But it's really the people. The people that I've got to know, the, the experts that I've come to rely on, because as I've told you so many times, I do not pretend to be an expert on anything, honestly. Maybe I have some experience in uh, broadcasting or live streaming or radio or TV or whatever. But when it comes to hunting and fishing, I am not an expert. I am, I am a passionate participant. I love to do it, but I'm no better at it than, than you are. But 
because of the position I've been in for the last so many years, I've had a chance to know and know very well so many experts in the field of hunting and fishing and shooting and trapping. And uh, my guest this hour is, 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 is certainly one of those people. He is a guy, honestly, he is the guy that I hear more about from people saying, you know, I really enjoy it when you have this guy on the show. He really knows what he's talking about. And his name is Richard P. Smith. He is a noted whitetail and black bear expert. Um, and he's one of my go-to guys. And he's, I was able to track him down this, this weekend and have him as our guest this hour on the Outdoor Magazine show. Richard, welcome back. How are you? I'm great, Mike. How about you? I am doing just fine. I mean, this is a great time of year, isn't it? It is terrific. Gets busy. It does get busy. And busy for you. Listen, are you coming downstate? Are you going to be at the Woods and Water Show next weekend? Yes, I am. In fact, uh, the new book, um, Woods and Waters News uh, published a release about the new book in their September issue. I will have the new book at the show this year. And, of course, that new book is? Book 8 of Great Michigan Deer Tales. How many stories in this one, Richard? Well, there's 17 chapters. In the, all of the previous seven books, there's only been 15 chapters. This one has two added chapters, so readers will get more bang for their buck, so to speak. So, No pun intended. So, <laughs> so is, is the two additional chapters, is, is that because there's just that, there, there, there are more stories these days? There are more people shooting big bucks in Michigan these days? Uh, not necessarily more, uh, but certainly as many as in the past, but there are uh, several unique chapters in this new book that I thought it was important to include, and I didn't get the information I needed to complete the chapters until after I'd done most of the book, one of which is about Tony LaPratt, uh, who's Michigan's buckmaster. He's, he's taken trophy box, books, box of record book quality on his 52 acres, 32 or 36 years in a row. Very few people can make that claim. No, uh, that's interesting. You give him that title, Michigan's Buckmaster. Uh, you know, some people would say, well, John Eberhardt might be vying for that title. Title. Some people would say, you know, uh, despite the controversy he brings, Mitch, Mitch Rompola might vie for that title. So that's interesting. Yeah, I think the title fits. I think it does, too, when you tell me what his, what his uh, credentials are. So you're going to come down to the Woods and Water Show Outdoor Weekend next weekend. People can have a chance to, to buy your book, and they can have a chance to talk with you in person. And I know a lot of people look forward to that opportunity. Yeah, that's correct. And, of course, I'll have my other titles and my DVDs on uh, field judging bears and walking with whitetails there, too. Well, two of my favorite topics, especially bear hunting. Boy, that's coming up right around the corner now, Richard. It sure is. And you, of course, <laughs> because you know how to do it, you have a you have a Michigan tag. Yep, exactly. And unfortunately, that's going to be harder and harder to come by in the future. <clears throat> now, why is that? The, the next regulation cycle for bear regulations is in 2023, next year. The DNR is uh, recommending cutting back permit quotas again in uh, the Red Oak Management Unit in the Northern Lower Peninsula, the Berglund Unit in the UP, and the Newberry Unit. Newberry? Now you're talking something that's going to affect me. Yeah, they're talking about reducing permits by 165 for the Newberry Unit, uh, and it already takes eight or nine years to draw a permit for the first hunt in the Newberry unit, this reduction will push it to 10 years before you can draw a permit for the first hunt in the Newberry, which is ridiculous. Well, Richard, every, it's, it seems to me, and this is purely anecdotal, but it seems to me like we have a good, healthy bear population. We're seeing more and more bears downstate where I live, which makes me think that, you know, these are, these are young male bears being pushed out and looking for new territory. What am I missing here? Well, you're not missing anything. That's, that's the case. And, in fact, um, the DNR had their annual bear forum meeting last week in St. Ignace. They moved it to August from December 
to give them more time to uh, prepare regulations for the Natural Resources Commission. <clears throat> and the population estimate, the latest one they have, which is prior to the hunt in 2021, shows the UP bear population increased by at least 1,000 animals from the year before. <clears throat> and the northern lower population also increased. Yet they're cutting back permit numbers because of high harvests in the Berglund, Newberry, and Red Oak units during 2021. But the reason for those high harvests is there's a growing bear population. There's more bears out there, and hunters are having more success. Cutting back permits is not going to – the DNR wants to stabilize the bear population in the northern lower and slow the increase in the UP. Cutting back permit numbers is not going to accomplish that. So who has input in this? Obviously, DNR biologists do. What what other groups are uh, got the D, the department's well, ear on this? All of the uh, major UP hunting groups, the Michigan Bear Hunters Association, UP Bear Houndsmen. Uh, there's a number of bow archery groups, Michigan Bow Hunters, uh, and MUCC is on the forum, has a member on the forum. Uh, these groups and, and every individual has an opportunity to provide input now or when the regulations go to the Natural Resources Commission in March of 2023. Well, I thought, because I had been talking to you, I had a pretty good system here now that I could go for the third season in Newberry and get a, get a tag basically every other year. Maybe now it's going to go to every third year, so I better make the most out of my hunt that I've got coming up. Yeah, exactly. And, and it, it's frustrating. I heard from a hunter... Uh, who had eight preference points going into the drawing for 2022? Who applied for the Newberry unit and they were declined. They didn't. They weren't successful. And with the redu if the reduction in licenses is going to affect for next year, they may not even be success successful with nine preference points for next year. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that because I love to bear hunt. I mean, I, I, I don't want to do anything that would hurt our bear population, though. So, I, I, you know, I'm a little bit conflicted there. Um, but let's talk about this season coming up. I've got a tag. You've got a tag. A lot of our listeners have a tag. And I think you just got back from a bear baiting trip, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Uh, started baits uh, a couple weeks ago in the Keweenaw, and they're all looking good. Uh, there's plenty of bears. How, if you don't mind me asking, how many baits have you got going? Well, I'm I'm running three. And and how did you decide where to put these baits? Are these bait sites that you've been running for years that you know are proven? Yes, yes. So how does somebody start a new bait site though? That's a question I get all the time, and I really don't know the answer to that. Where where do you go? Where do you put these baits? Well, what when I'm in a new area, I look for food sources first. Uh, acorns, beech nuts, wild cherries, apples, uh, food sources that bears normally depend on and feed on. And when I find these feed so food sources, I look for bear sign, tracks, droppings, uh, feeding activity, and to confirm the presence of bears. Then I locate the closest security cover to that food source, such as a swamp, a marsh, uh, high ridges uh, where bears would be uh, for security cover, where they bed down. Uh, and I put a bait on the edge of uh, security cover, or if I find an opening inside the swamp, even better to put a bait. And I look for trees uh, that are suitable for a tree stand, downwind considering the prevailing wind direction from where I place the bait. We're talking with uh, noted uh, black bear expert uh, Richard P. Smith. Did I start at the wrong time, Charlie? Are we good to go? Okay. Uh, Richard P. Smith, his website, richardpsmith.com. That's richardpsmith.com. You can talk with Richard in person uh, next weekend in Imlay City at the Eastern Michigan Fairgrounds at the uh, Woods and Water News Outdoor Weekend. Richard's website, again, richardpsmith.com, richardpsmith.com. Got to take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine Show, but I have a lot more questions for Richard, and we will get to them after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. You 
can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Lansing on WILS 1320 AM. You can hear us in Sandusky on WMIC 660 AM 95.3 FM. And you can hear us, uh, let's go uh, Let's go to Escanaba, the Riviera of the North, WCHT 600 AM 95.3 FM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by MUCC's On the Ground program. OTG is a program to improve habitat for fish and wildlife across the state. For details, check out the Michigan United Conservation Club's website. That's MUCC.org, MUCC.org. And if you go to that website and sign up to become an MUCC member for the first time, you can save 25% by using the promo code MIKE, all caps, M-I-K-E. That's at MUCC.org. While you are uh, online, I would encourage you to check out my website, MikeEveryOutdoors.com, and then uh, then head on over to RichardPSmith.com. As you can imagine, RichardPSmith.com is the website of noted uh, whitetail and black bear expert and outdoor writer Richard P. Smith. His latest edition of his book, uh, Great uh, Michigan Deer Tales, is available on the website and he will also be at the uh, Outdoor Weekend in Imlay City next weekend, uh, where you can see him uh, in person. Um, Richard, your um, your sights there in the Keweenaw. Are you? How's the berry crop, by the way? There, it, it's fair. Uh, there's good blueberry crop at one of the locations uh, where I've got bait, and that's. There were bear already in that area when I put the bait in. I saw fresh bear droppings um, and tracks on the way in to when I established that bait, when it was legal to start baiting. And that's always an advantage of locating a food source that bears are already using when starting a bait. They're already in the area, and it increases the chances they'll find the bait quickly. And how often then, now that this bait is established, will you bait? Uh, probably twice a week um, until just before the season, and then I'll start uh, every day, the f- few days before the hunt. My hunt starts on the 25th of September. Oh, you've got the late season too then? Right. Okay. Uh, so do you use trail cameras at all, Richard? Yeah, I do, but I don't have them up yet. Um, I usually put them up closer to when the season starts because bear numbers increase uh, the closer you get to the season. Isn't it amazing what a scouting tool those have developed into? Yes, they're very useful. Um, you and I, when we talk about bear hunting, it's almost always about hunting over bait. I don't, I don't want to leave the uh, hound hunters out. Yeah, hound hunting is very popular in Michigan. Uh, there's a smaller percentage of hunters who use hounds. It's far more expensive uh, to maintain hounds year-round and train them and uh, to hunt with hounds. Well, and, and you know, in some circles, the houndsmen have a bad, a ba- bad reputation. They get a bad rap, and it's from people who say, "Well, you know, they they trespass and such." I, I, I don't know. Any thoughts on that, Richard? Well, there are bad actors in every group. Sure, and there, there certainly are some bad actors among hound hunters, who in most cases don't belong to any any organized group like the Michigan Bear Hunters or UP Bear Houndsmen, uh, and they're not as respectful of private property is those who are concerned about their image. Uh, hound hunt, many hound hunters that I know are concerned about their image because they know they have a bad rap in many cases. And when they, with the GPS collars most hound hunters use now, when they realize their hounds are headed for private property, they can intercept them and stop them from going in private property. In most cases, not all cases. Um, and many hunters try and do that to reduce conflicts and, and negative comments. Well, one thing that the hound hunters certainly have going for them is they can they can take the time to judge the size of an animal and decide if they want to take that animal. Yeah, exactly. In fact, hound hunting is uh, the best form of catch and release hunting that we have. In fact, the only form of catch and release uh, because. Hound hunters, many times their hounds will tree a bear, and they can look at it, and they let many small bears go. And in some cases, they let females go and select for males. Now, a female, a sow, without cubs is a legal target. Is it an ethical target? Yes. 
There's nothing wrong with shooting an adult female that doesn't have cubs. They are legal targets. And we, as, as we discussed earlier, our bear population is increasing uh, and doing very well. Part of the reason it's increasing is that we have regulations that protect females that have cubs. That increases the number of adult females we have in the population. Let's talk about one of my favorite topics with you, judging the size of a black bear. Because for so many hunters, myself included uh, early on, it, it's, such a, it, it's so hard. You, you look at a white-tailed buck and you can see the rack. You know what you're dealing with. You look at a bear, especially for people who haven't seen a lot of them, and it can be very tough, Richard. There's a lot of ground shrinkage for many Michigan bear hunters. <laughs> it's a very common term among bear hunters is ground shrinkage. And the problem is most hunters don't have much of an opportunity to view bears in the wild. And they may only see a handful over a period of years. Uh, in the, the hair on bears, it, it makes them look larger than they really are, too. So how big is an average Michigan black bear taken by a Michigan hunter? 125 to 200 pounds, maybe a little bit less than 200. Mm -hmm. 125 to 175 is probably average size for a Michigan black bear. Which I think is a little <laughs> like deer, right? We A lot of hunters tend to, to be a little generous in the size of their animal when they're talking about them. Exactly. So how do we judge a black bear, Richard? Well, there are several easy techniques that anybody can use. And, of course, they're covered on that, my DVD that the length of the bears is critical. Males are larger than females. They have longer bodies, and they stand taller off the ground. Their legs are longer. Uh, so if you have a ruler, a stick of a known length or a log of a known length at a bait, say five foot and you put that at, at a bait and you can in a position where where the bear is feeding you can see how it lines up with the, the ruler a bear that's more than five foot length from nose to tail is most often a male a bear that's shorter than five inch five feet from nose to tail is either a female or a young male um, and height wise a large adult male will be about three feet when standing on all four feet. Three, its top of its back will be three feet from the ground, which is about the height of a 50-gallon or 55-gallon barrel. Uh, and those that are shorter are smaller. And looking at the head of a bear, if you imagine the tri a triangle on a bear's head with the base of the triangle between the ears and the triangle extending to the nose. If you see a bear that the sides of the triangle are much longer than the distance between the ears, most often that's a female or a young male. If the sides of the triangle are close to equal, you're looking at an adult male. What about the, the general shape? Can, if you look at a bear and you say you didn't, you didn't have anything to judge the size of it, but you just the, the general shape, is there anything you can tell from that? Well, the ears, look at the proportion of the size of the ears to the head and how far apart they are. A small bear will have ears that look big, and they'll be close together. Uh, an older bear, as their head increases in size, those ears will look smaller in proportion to the size of the head, and they will be farther apart. Can the behavior, the demeanor of a bear as it comes into a bait, can we use that to our benefit or uh, knowledge in any way? Certainly. Uh, a bear that approaches a bait tentatively and uh, cautiously circling the bait before it goes in to feed and maybe grabs food and walks away with it so it doesn't stay at the bait, that's a subordinate bear, a smaller bear that's concerned about the presence of a bigger bear that that might injure it, attack it, if it catches it. Uh, in a bear that comes directly in, makes all kinds of noise, goes directly to the bait, you know that's a dominant adult bear. And, of course, if you see a, a small bear at a bait, or say you have a bear at the bait, and all of a sudden it takes off like a shot, it, it heard or smelled or saw a bigger bear that's approaching. So, all right, so what about shot placement? Say you're say you're bow hunting. Where do you shoot a bear with a bow? Well, uh, 
a broadside or angling away shot are the best two positions for a bear to be in for a bow shot. And <clears throat> you want to avoid that front shoulder. So on a broadside bear, aim for the middle of the body from top to bottom and is an inch or two behind the shoulder blade. On an angling away, away bear, uh, you want to consider aim for the opposite shoulder uh, so the arrow angles forward into the chest cavity, so you're going to be aiming farther behind the near shoulder uh, than you would on a broadside bear. And because bear's fur is so long, I mean, they do tend to plug up, right? Uh, uh, more than a white tail, maybe? They can, because of the heavy layers of fat they normally have in the fall. Uh, but if you have a pass-through, which is ideal, you'll have an entry and an exit wound, and the exit wound usually produces the better blood trail. If you only have an entry wound, um, you very likely have a poor blood trail. And I want to point out here, Mike, that in my book, uh, Black Bear Hunting, the second edition of Black Bear Hunting, I have photos of bears in different positions showing marks where to aim with both uh-huh. firearms and bow and arrow. All right. And speaking of, <laughs> excuse me, speaking of firearm, before I let you go, First time I've ever hunted bear with a gun is going to be this fall. Mm-hmm. Uh, 350 Legend, 180 grain bullet. Where do I shoot him? Well, depending on the position it's it's in. Yep. Uh, w- with that bullet, you could shoot a bear on the shoulder blade and break the shoulder and very likely drop the bear on the spot. Uh, with a center fire rifle like that, 30 caliber or larger, uh, you can sh- break the shoulder, aim right on the shoulder blade. Uh, and that'll take out the lungs, too. All right. Richard, always a pleasure. Good luck on your hunt. Uh, have fun on your trip downstate. I would encourage people to stop by the uh, Eastern Michigan Fairgrounds in Emily City at the Woods and Water Show to stop by and see you, Richard, and they can get your books and videos, including the latest edition of Great Michigan Deer Tales, at richardpsmith.com. Always a pleasure, Richard. Thanks a lot. All right, thanks. Good luck to you, too. I do appreciate that. I'll take all the luck that I can get. When I'm on the water or in the woods, that's for sure. RichardPSmith.com. We'll take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine Show. When we come back, oh, a few more things I want to talk about before we wrap it all up with wild game chef extraordinaire Dixie Dave Miner and another great wild game recipe. I don't know what he has planned. I never know until he joins us on the air. That's all coming up right here on Outdoor Magazine. the Outdoor Magazine show in Manistique on WTIQ AM and FM, 1490 AM, 95.3 FM. And you can hear us downstate in Saginaw on WSGW, again in AM and FM combo, 790 AM, 100.5 FM. In fact, I'm in the studios of WSGW right now for these three hours. This one small corner of the building, I call it the Outdoor Magazine Studio. Nobody else does, but I do. And I've got, uh, I've got a logo behind me, so I can, I can kind of get away with it. I'm in here with Charlie Rude, doing a wonderful job as always. And because it is a beautiful day today, I mean, I just looked out there. There's not a cloud in the sky. The humidity is down. It's a cool temperature. It's beautiful. And because of that, our crowd here to see Charlie is one of the biggest I have seen in months. They are lined up along the driveway, holding signs and, and chanting, Charlie, Charlie. And they can't wait till we get this show done so he can get out there and sign some autographs and take some pictures and kiss some babies. And it's just, it's, it's like an old school politician. They just, they can't wait to see Charlie out there. It's really quite a phenomenon. It's, it's amazing what it's evolved into. Pat is very popular. Pat Johnston. Very popular. But I think because Charlie's been on the air longer, Pat's not quite drawing the crowds yet that Charlie does. I'm sure he will in time, but not quite yet. It's it's amazing to work with two broadcasting radio icons that I do. It's just it's really something else. (laughs) It's something else, all right. (laughs) Oh, I 
love this job. Hey, can you believe that it's Labor Day weekend? How did that get to be? Summertime, just it just flew by, didn't it? I do hope you had a chance to get out and, and do the things you wanted with your family this summer. There's still, hey, listen, there's still lots of nice weather coming up. But I will be honest, I'm, I'm, I've pretty much made the transition from a fishing mode into a hunting mode. I know there is some fantastic fishing to be had in the fall. I get it. But our, our hunting seasons have already started here in Michigan. Uh, if you were lucky enough to get an early elk season, that, that, that's open. Uh, the, uh, the teal season is open now. The early giant flying rat season is open now. You might know it as the goose season. Uh, small game season opening just around the corner. The youth hunt is next weekend. I'll be out with my grandson, Carter, the last time he can take advantage of the youth hunt, by the way. Uh, bear season just around the corner. I mean, it's, it's here. It's, we're getting ready to rock here now. And I could not be, uh, I couldn't be more excited. I love to fish, right? I, I, first and foremost, I think, I think my first love is fishing. I think I am a fisherman who also loves to hunt. But this time of year, I'm more geeked about um, more geeked about hunting, especially uh, you know. Other than the youth hunt, my my Michigan bear hunt coming up. I'm real, real excited about that. I've never taken a bear in Michigan. I've only bear hunted in Michigan once before, and I had an opportunity. The first day of my hunt, I was hunting with Gary Morgan of uh, Wild Game Dynasty. I was hunting uh, in the UP. In the Newberry District, where I will be hunting with Johnny Bowler here coming up in a few weeks. But I was, I was sitting in ground blind with a crossbow on a rainy Saturday afternoon. And I wasn't in the blind a half hour. And I had a respectable bear come walking by me into the bait. And at that time, I had waited nine years. It took me nine years to get that Michigan bear tag. And I said, I, I, I'm, I love bear hunting too much. I love bear hunting so much that I am not willing to end my Michigan bear hunt 30 minutes into the season. So I didn't take that bear. I let him go. Now, I think Gary was probably a little frustrated with me because of that, because of all the work he had put into in that bait, getting that bait going and then getting that bear come in there. So to have me just look at it and videotape it and have it walk away. But I did. And I did, uh, I did see another bear later in the season on, was it that same bait or a different one? I don't remember. Didn't get a shot at this bear, so I did not take a Michigan bear in my first season of bear hunting in Michigan. I really want to this year. Whereas, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I went up to White River, Ontario, bear hunting, but really not feeling the urge to take an animal. I went up there to bear hunt, but not to kill a bear, if, if, that, if, if that means, if you can figure that one out. But on this hunt, yes, I'm looking for the experience. I, I, I'm really looking forward to the hunt. But I, I really, I'll be honest with you, this, I really would like to take a Michigan bear. I would really like to be able to say these brats that I'm eating on the grill right now are from a Michigan animal. And taken with, um, you know, a Michigan-made gun. I, I'm just, I'm really geeked about it. I'm very excited about it, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I wouldn't mind getting out on Saginaw Bay at least a couple of more times, maybe for a late season walleye trip or maybe a perch trip. Um, but there's, there's so much going on in the fall. How do, how do you work it all in? And it is September now, by the way, welcome to the month of September. It's going to get nothing but better from now, uh, from, from now on, from, from here on out. Pretty exciting time of year, isn't it? Hey, my website is MikeAveryOutdoors.com, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. I would encourage you to check that out. More importantly, my email address is Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. If you want to reach out to me, if you have a question, a comment, if you have a question for the Ask Avery segment, a comment, a criticism, a suggestion, that is the single best way to get in touch with me unless you know my cell phone number, and I'm not putting that out over the air. Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. We'll take a break. Wrap it all up with Wild Game Chef Dixie Dave Miner right here on Outdoor Magazine.
Thank you so much for joining me on this week's Outdoor Magazine show. If you are a new listener, welcome. I hope you've enjoyed the show. I hope you come back. If you are a veteran listener, I do appreciate that. And if you have uh, heard the show before, you know that I like to wrap up each week's show with wild game chef extraordinaire Dixie Dave Miner, a guy that I have worked with for many, many years, going back to the early days of the old Outdoor Magazine television show. He's been a popular part of the Outdoor Magazine franchise and continues to be today. David, welcome back. How are you, buddy? I'm fine, Michael. How about yourself? I'm doing good. Boy, as you look outside, it's a glorious day today, isn't it? It's glorious up in Standish, too. Oh, that's what I that's what I figured. What have you got for us this week, David? Well, I got a tequila peppered salmon. It's almost like a salmon a poivre. Ah, okay. So just one second. <laughs> I can tell. In different can tell. position here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Trading cars with the wife. Okay. So this is going to be for two portions. And you need about 8 to 10 ounces of boneless, skinless per person. And you could crush pepper with a uh, frying pan, you know, and you could buy it. You can buy it already kind of crushed, but it's not going to have that same pugnant taste and that peppery taste because who knows how long it's been cracked, you know. So what you want to do is take up. A wooden board works the very best. You can take a frying pan with a flat bottom, put the pepper out, and then push against it with just the part of the pan that where the handle is. Try to crack it that way. If not, put it between two pieces of like a bread wrap or something in a meat mallet and beat it. <laughs> so you need about one to two ounces of tequila, a splash of sweet and sour mix, and if you can come across a small bottle of roses, sweetened lime juice, that works really good. I mean, it helps to build it up. It's almost going to be like a margarita sauce. Hmm. So you need about three ounces of uh, fish stock if you want to boil the bones and take the time and energy to uh, do that. Strain it through a sieve, thicken it up with some cornstarch or a couple of ounces of chicken gravy works just as good just as the medium to hold everything together. Quarter cup of diced onions, two to three cloves of garlic diced fine, olive oil, and two to three, four pats of butter, depending on how much sauce you want to make. Rub the fillets with olive oil. Press the pepper into meat, the meat both sides. You want it to stick. That olive oil helps do that a little bit, or as little as you like. I prefer a lot. I know you would, too. Mm-hmm. So um, after you get that done, Take a nice hot pan. You might even want to do this outside on the barbecue because it will be very choking and uh, make your eyes water. But And make sure you got your hood vent on real good. So you want to start it with the uh, skin side up, rib side down. Put a little bit of olive oil in the pan and then lay it down there just like I said. And like I said, outside would be the best. So it's like a fish or poivre. Turn once. Put the skin side in the pan and then add the onions and garlic on the side of the pan a little bit. Saute them down just a couple seconds. You don't want to brown them. Then add the gravy. Do not put anything on top. Put it all in the pan because you want that look of that pepper on the red meat, okay? So then add everything out there. The tequila, the roses, the lime, um, roses, lime, the butter, sour mix. Mix it up. Kind of stir it around real good. And then bake it, 350-degree oven, maybe 10 minutes, 12. Don't forget, salmon is going to continue cooking once you take it out. You don't want to really overdo this a lot. And I promise it'll be well done by that time. So take some of that sauce, put it on the plate, put the filet on top. Maybe if you got a little bit of chopped parsley, I'll tell you what, it is looks super and it tastes even better than it looks. It, it sounds great, Dave. Now, how, you know, the later in the season we go, the darker the salmon are going to get, the darker the fish in the rivers are going to get. Is yes. this a recipe that would lend itself well to some of those later season fish? That's what I was thinking. I should have mentioned that myself, but thanks for bringing that up. Because what it's going to do, if the fish has a little strong flavor to it and it's still edible, this would be just a great way to do it. 
Mm. Yeah, that makes it's real. It's a real strong, flavorful, robust sort of sauce. No, it sounds great. It sounds great. Now, David, if we want to try your cooking in person, I can know. I know we can stop by Oscar and Joey's. But where do we find Oscar and Joey's? Well, exit one hundred and thirty-six on I seventy-five. We're just a tenth of a mile east of the interchange, right on the southeast corner of the. Uh, by the traffic light. You go through the traffic light, and we're right there. Our driveway is right there. And uh, like I said, it's uh, 12027 Dixie, if you're going to Google it. What days are you open now, David? Thursday through Sunday, Michael. Still can't get the help. And it's it's amazing. What Where are people uh, not working at it? <laughs> <laughs> Thursday through Sundays. All right, David, always a pleasure. Uh, enjoy the weather, and we'll talk again next week. We sure shall. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Wild Game Chef extraordinaire Dixie Dave Miner, a big part of the Outdoor Magazine show. As are you. Because if you weren't listening, there'd be no reason to do the show. There'd be no reason for me to talk to Dave. There'd be no reason for me to talk to our other guests. There'd be no reason for me to have the social media. I mean, the, 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 the radio show is kind of a the crux of it all, the heart of it all. And I appreciate you being along with me. The website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. The email address, Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. Do not hesitate to use that to reach out and, and talk with me. Questions, comments, criticisms, I'm here. My name is Mike Avery, and I will talk to you next time right here on Outdoor Magazine. Outdoor Magazine.